I'm live now. Cool. It's been a really long time since I've done this. It actually took me a while to figure out how to get the scheduled live stream to actually start. So here I am. Um, yeah, it's been a while because I've been pretty, pretty busy with, you know, interpreting. Um, you know, I teach interpretation as well with an organization. Uh, I'm a co-founder of an interpreting practice website. So lots and lots and lots of stuff going on, which is why I haven't been able to post, which is why I haven't been able to um, record any videos. So I am doing this video today because it's super, super important, I think. If you've been tuned in to any of my social media channels, anything on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, any of that stuff, you've seen me posting a lot about Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. So there are actually some proposed changes coming to section 1557, and these changes have a lot to do with language access. Now, these changes, and they're proposed, so these haven't gone through yet. The Department of Health and Human Services, the US Department of Health and Human Services, has released this document called the NPRM, which is a notice of proposed rulemaking. So it's the 2022 section 1557, NPRM. And what it does is it basically outlines, okay, these are the changes we want to make. Uh, we want public comments on this stuff. Please give us feedback on this before we actually go and write what's called the final rule. So we've actually had two previous final rules on Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. I swear to you, if my husband hears me say one more time, Section 1557, he's, he's going to lose his mind. Um, in fact, I, he's probably overhearing me right now and he's probably like, ah, oh, I don't want to hear it. So section 1557, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the non-discrimination provision of the Affordable Care Act. So it basically says it expands upon some of those protected groups that were established by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the original three protected groups under Title VI were race, color, and national origin. So anything receiving federal funding could not discriminate against people based on their race, color, or national origin. Now, how this applies to language access is national origin includes someone's ability and ability to speak English, speak or understand English. So it includes someone's English proficiency. More importantly, um, someone with limited English proficiency, so someone with LEP, um, in the legislation and in the proposed rule, they refer to this as uh, LEP, I believe, LEP persons. Don't personally like that. I prefer people with LEP, you know, person first language and all that. Um, but this, that's the federal, that's the official language for the, um, for the NPRM and for Section 1557 in and of itself. So Title VI establishes that we cannot, in any entity receiving federal funding, um, prohibit against certain protected groups. And then, of course, as years have gone on, we've added additional protected groups. So we started off with race, color, and national origin. We added sex. We added age. We added, oh my goodness, disability. Um, so the disability part really applies to sign language interpretation. Um, and other, they're called auxiliary aids. So they're things that facilitate communication for folks with disabilities. Um, and while many folks um, in the deaf community would not consider being deaf a disability, it's just the language that's in the, the legislation, which is why I which is why I'm saying in this context, talking about laws. But I'm really going to focus on the spoken language implications of Section 1557. Um, first off, as they exist right now. So as it exists right now, there are a couple of different things. The first thing is that, so Section 1557, first off, applies specifically to healthcare. So you have federal, um, federal funding, right? If you receive funding from the Department of Health and Human Services directly or indirectly, you can't discriminate against the protected groups in the provision of your services. Um, and if you're engaged in the business of healthcare. So for instance, if you're a hospital, chances are you receive federal funding directly or indirectly from HHS. If you accept Medicaid, Medicare, any of that stuff, 
uh, unless you're only accepting Medicare Part B uh, as of this moment. Even if it's from a single patient who receives care at your facility, that doesn't mean that only that patient can't be discriminated against. It means that anyone coming to that facility can't be discriminated against based upon those protected groups. So Section 1557 um, says that, and it expands upon that a little bit. It says, in terms of language access, that the use of qualified interpreters and translators, we need to use qualified interpreters and translators. Um, now, well, we'll get into a little bit of the definitions of those. It also says that, except in very limited cases, you should not be using minor children, so children under the age of 18, to interpret nor should you be using accompanying adults to interpret. Both of those can be surpassed if it's like a case of emergency. So for instance, if there's a natural disaster and there are no qualified interpreters available at the time, you know, okay, well, it makes sense in that case to maybe utilize the services of someone who might not be a qualified interpreter to interpret in those instances. And then for accompanying adults, it says that it's okay to utilize accompanying adult as an interpreter if the person with limited English proficiency specifically requests the use of that person, and then that person has to accept. Um, now, what it said before versus what it says in the NPRM, little fuzzy on that, um, but I want to switch now into the gear of what are we talking about? What are the proposed changes to um, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act? There were a lot of things that, that changed. So I, I want to briefly talk about the history of Section 1557. So, of course, in uh, 2010, we had the Affordable Care Act passed. Uh, and Section 1557, it had its first final rule in 2016. Then that was under the Obama administration. Then under the Trump administration in 2020, we had the second final rule. And the second final rule changed a lot of things. Um, and a lot of people had issues with this, myself included. And some of the things that it did, so there is this taglines requirement where if you are a covered entity, an entity required to follow Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, if I had a nickel for every time I've said that the past week, um, you uh, have to provide these taglines that basically say, we will provide language assistance free of charge to you, qualified language assistance services, et cetera, et cetera, including but not limited to, et cetera, et cetera. That's what it says now. But before it said you had to do it in the top X languages, I think it was like 15. That got removed. So then there was no like implication that it had to be in any language other than English. So that was something that was removed in the 2016 rule. Something that was brought back with the 2016 rule was instead of determining to what extent we need to provide language assistance based on individual need, it was based on people with limited English proficiency as this kind of like monolithic group. Like we're going to weigh, it was this thing called the four factor analysis, which um, be completely honest, this is entirely my opinion, but it's an opinion shared by a lot of people as was expressed by the Department of Health and Human Services when they were discussing why they're changing the rule, they said a lot of people were commenting about how they didn't like the four-factor analysis. So the four-factor analysis is something that was brought about by this executive order called Executive Order 13166. And it was part of actually like a guidance document associated with that. And basically the four-factor analysis, I always forget what the four factors are. So this is why Kelly has her very, very handy dandy um, visuals and things to help her. I don't have any visuals for you all today. Um, but the four factor analysis, let's see if I can't find it. I have about 20 different tabs open here. Well, let's do this. We'll do this. So you'll have to bear with me for just one second. I had it open, but then somehow it disappeared probably because Kelly has way too much stuff on her hands. So the four factor analysis, basically what you do is, um, <laughs> you balance these four factors in determining to what extent you need to provide language assistance to comply with meaningful access requirements. So if you're required to provide language assistance, 
under Section 1557, you have to provide meaningful access to your services for people with limited English proficiency. And you do this, you, you determine to what extent you need to do this by weighing these four factors. So the four factors are, um, first, nature. So how important the service is to people's lives. That's supposed to be the factor that you weigh the heaviest. But there are three other factors. There is demographics. So what percentage of people in the area, for instance, are of limited English proficiency, speak the language that you're talking about. Um, frequency of contact, okay, well, how often does your entity, let's say if you're a hospital or a clinic, how often do you come in contact with this particular group of people? Um, and then the last one is availability and cost. So technically, if a healthcare facility said, oh, we're a really small clinic um, and we can't afford to provide language assistance, if they could prove it, that, you know, well, the nature of their services isn't like so, so important, like a hospital, it's gonna be really hard for a hospital to make that argument that the nature of their services is not essential to human life. Like people come there when they have a heart attack, when they have any kind of medical emergency, super, super important. So not providing language assistance, there are multiple reasons why that's not really feasible in hospitals. Um, but if you're a small clinic, if you're only doing primary care, or, you know, maybe you're, you know, cosmetic plastic, cosmetic, procedures and things like that. Okay, the nature of your services isn't that essential, right? Um, not to say that, you know, some people don't need those things, but you know. Um, so if the cost was too much, if you're a smaller clinic, you know, the resources, meh. and this is only for spoken language. So to be clear, section 1557 does have some implications for sign language. Uh, however, I'm not going to talk about those because one, I'm not an expert on that. And two, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking was 97 pages long, and I've read all of it, and I took a lot of notes. I probably took like 30 pages of notes. So, yeah, that's a lot. That's Kelly, Kelly already bites off more than she can chew. She don't need to bite off that either. So, that is what changed. The main thing that changed in the um, 2016 final rule of 20... Of, Section 1557. Actually, another thing that happened, a couple of things. One, they removed the, there's usually a part of the legislation that's like a definitions section. They removed the definitions section. Um, so it still existed in the 2016 fin final rule, but then it got removed in the 2020 final rule. And then another thing, this is something that I noticed and something that a lot of people would come to me about because you know, I, I really am interested in language access laws and regulations. People would ask me, well, Kelly, where's the original text of, of section 1557 since the 2020 final rule came out? And you couldn't find a lot of this stuff. Like, I'm not sure whether they scrubbed them from the websites or what, or whether it just became harder to find. I don't know, but a lot of the stuff I could find before, all of a sudden I couldn't find anymore. So just stating an observation here. So, that changed a lot of things. We had the pandemic. And this is as outlined in kind of the introduction of the notice of proposed rulemaking for 2022. That, you know, they set the stage here that the reason why we're going through these changes here, proposing these changes, is because a lot of stuff changed during the pandemic. The pandemic highlighted a lot highlighted a lot of existing exacerbated even a lot of existing health disparities in uh, minority communities. So that's one of the reasons why these changes are coming about. Another one is that, you know, there's pending litigation as a result of some of the changes in the 2020 final rule. Um, and section 1557, like I said, it doesn't ha just have to do with spoken language. It has to deal with um, the protected group of sex, um, including gender identity. It has to do with um, disability. It has to do with all sorts of stuff. That Those are like the main big hitters, but it deals with all sorts of protected groups. It's uh, as Mara Yodelman said um, when she gave her, her um, webinar through the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters, she said, this is truly an intersectional piece of legislation, which I thought was really cool to hear that. So I really appreciate her contributions towards all of this. And she's really helped me in my understanding. So I just a shout out to her for being as awesome as she is. She's with the National Health Law Program. 
this is probably a great point for me to point out that I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a legal professional. I'm just a language access laws enthusiast. And I teach language access laws and regulations um, in an interpreter training program. So these things are really salient, really important to me. Um, I have to teach these things. Uh, so this, of course, has implications on what I'm actually teaching people in the classes that I teach that are very basic classes. So, sorry, my phone was going off there for a sec. Um, so when we get into the actual changes uh, that they're proposing for Section 1557, we're finally getting to the meat of it after 15 minutes, um, which coincidentally is probably about how long it took me to put on my massive amount of eye makeup that you can't even see on camera. Uh, in terms of changes, so there are a couple different things. I'm going to go through the different sections and how they apply to language access. And I'm only going to go through the ones that I feel, based on my totally unprofessional, non-legal opinion, um, apply to language access. So the first thing that was huge to me, which was the first thing that I looked for, was the definitions provision of Section 1557. And it's back, y'all. I'm super happy about that. Um, and there are a lot of definitions that really apply to language access here. We have the definition of uh, qualified interpreters, qualified translators. We have the definition of language assistance services. So what do language assistance services include? Uh, this includes interpretation and translation. So it defines these things for people who maybe don't understand what these things are, because not all of us are interpreters and translators, not all of us are linguists, and not all of us are language services coordinators. It also defines machine translation which is interesting and highly relevant to this particular proposed rule because they talk a lot about machine translation and they talk a lot about telehealth, um, which I think telehealth applies to machine translation and vice versa. National origin is also defined, which doesn't seem like a big deal if you know, oh, yeah, I know national origin includes someone's English proficiency naturally. <laughs> if you're a nerd like me and all the other people, right? who are in our industry or in our profession. Um, but the interesting thing here is they actually change, uh, they make it a little bit more explicit in the definition section that national origin includes English proficiency. So this is more explicit now, which is kind of cool. Then, so like I said, we have qualified interpreter, qualified translator, and so I'm going to go ahead and read, and this is directly from the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, their proposed definition of qualified interpreter, which as a medical interpreter, I'm of course going to be super interested in this. So it says here, a qualified interpreter for a limited English proficient individual means an interpreter who, via a remote interpreting service or an on-site appearance, that's me. Uh, one, has demonstrated proficiency in speaking and understanding both spoken English and at least one other spoken language. Two, is able to interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially to and from such languages and English using any necessary specialized vocabulary or terms without changes, omissions, or additions, and while preserving the tone, sentiment, and emotional level of the original oral statement. And three, adheres to generally accepted interpreter ethics principles, including client confidentiality. So naturally, I have some opinions on that. Um, because unfortunately, and this is something I mentioned in my comment, because I already submitted my comment. They want comments, y'all. And I'll tell you how to submit comments at the end here. Um, and there's, if you can't stay tuned for the whole live, it's fine. I have a bunch of resources in the description of this live as well. Um, for those of you who'd like to check it out. And also, you can also watch the stream later. It's going to be saved on my YouTube channel. Um, so first thing, um, has demonstrated proficiency in speaking and understanding both spoken English and at least one other spoken language. Okay, one, how? How are we proving that they've demonstrated proficiency? Um, and this is something that Mara mentioned in the NHELP, uh, and help, excuse me, uh, CCHI's uh, webinar on language access. How are you qualifying interpreters? Can you maybe make a requirement there that you have to have either one 
this is just an option. I, I'm not saying it requires certification because not all languages have certifications. Let's just put that out there. Um, one, certification, I think, should be at min like the minimum requirements for qualification, um, at least one of them. Two, okay, well, if they need to demonstrate proficiency in speaking and understanding these two languages, how are we defining their proficiency? Are we listing a number of language proficiency tests that can be accepted? Because unfortunately what happens, and I've seen this happen, is a lot of language service providers, they kind of just make random determinations of, oh yeah, this person can speak such and such a language. Um, I don't like that personally. Um, and again, these are my, these are my opinions, not saying you need to comment this. I'm not even saying that maybe I'm not thinking about something that I should. Uh, how? Uh, I also want to keep in mind, too, that we have indigenous languages, right? That how can you test a proficiency, someone's proficiency level in an indigenous language when there aren't a whole lot of speakers of that language? They might be one of the few speakers of that language. So in their right they're an authority on that language. So we can't really have an outside party coming in testing their proficiency, which is tough. So this highlights some of the issues that we have with this definition of qualified interpreter. Is that this is kind of like one size fits all thing. Um, another thing too, and this is something that um, more than one interpreter has actually mentioned to me, and this I believe has come up in the Oregon um, state law, or was it? Oregon state laws that they just passed a law where you have to be um, there's a certain level of qualifications that you have to have to be uh, an interpreter in that state. But the problem is, is that for some of these indigenous languages, because they want to, I believe the intent was to keep interpreters in the United States, like to give jobs to interpreters in the United States. But what happens is some languages, there aren't any speakers of that language available in the United States to interpret that language. Sometimes the only person that you have that's available of this limited pool of speakers of this language is available maybe in the home country where that language is spoken. In which case, they don't always speak English. So when that happens, you get what's called relay interpretation, where you have an interpreter who interprets, let's say, Cactiquel uh, in Spanish. Cactiquel is one of the Mayan languages, speak Spanish. They're joining remotely, and then we have a relay interpreter. We have another interpreter who interprets from Spanish to English. So you essentially have like this game of telephone where it's like Cactiquel, Spanish, Spanish, English. So if we're eliminating the ability for an interpreter to not have English as one of their working languages, we're essentially limiting ourselves to the English cocktail interpreters, which that's a much smaller pool. So I have an issue with that. Um, and again, this is something that I think Mara mentioned during the CCHI webinar. Um, so I have a real problem with the fact that there's kind of ambiguity left up to how interpreters are being qualified. I think, and I like the solution that multiple people I've spoken with have proposed, which is to put some minimum requirements for the most common languages, Spanish being one of them. Um, there's no shortage of ways to evaluate Spanish proficiency. There's no, including certification, um, there's no shortage of Spanish English interpreters. Like you don't need to have some obscure indigenous language in Spanish in order for someone who's Spanish speaking to be able to get interpretation services in English. It doesn't really need to happen. So I think that's one argument that can be made about this. Make it that way you will. Um, and then number two, the other requirement for qualified interpreter is able to interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially to and from such languages in English, Again, not all interpreters. I think it's weird to make all interpreters speak English because there are, we do use relay interpreters for some of these languages. And I think that's important to open our minds up to. Um, and it says using any necessary specialized vocabulary or terms without changes, omissions, or additions, 
and while preserving the tone, sentiment, and emotional level of the original oral statement. Okay, all of that sounds great. Like that sounds awesome to me. But again, how are we determining that that's happening? You can't just say, oh yeah, they're interpreting and all those words that I just said. Yeah, they're doing it. How? I think we really need to hold language service providers accountable for how they're evaluating their interpreters. Because I've seen it myself in person interpretation. This is why I really resent the argument that, oh, you have a lot of unqualified remote interpreters. We have a lot of unqualified in-person interpreters. And I do not fault those interpreters because in a lot of cases, it's these language services companies deciding to go ahead and, okay, well, we don't want to pay the going rate for a qualified interpreter. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of skirt the rules a little bit and we're not going to give them a whole bunch of training and we're going to pay them significantly less and we're going to tell them you're doing a good thing for people. Go out in the field and interpret for people with no experience in their training. That does happen and I've seen it and it's unfortunate. Um, and I, that's why I resent the fact that, you know, there's this prevailing argument that the unqualified interpretation is coming from remote interpreters. It comes a lot from in-person interpreters too. I've seen it, I've heard it. So we need to have some, in my opinion, as I said in the description of this, I'm gonna try and make it abundantly clear when I'm expressing my opinion. In my opinion, I feel like there needs to be some accountability for these qualifications for interpreters. And I think certification is a really, really great way to evaluate this. Also recognizing and accepting that certification is in a one size fits all solution for all languages. Because honestly, if you just have a written certification exam for your language and you're not even testing your language proficiency, you need to have that certification in addition to a language proficiency exam, in my opinion. And then the last one says, and me as the ethics queen, which I have a friend who called me the ethics queen the other day, and I was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, I love you. Uh, adheres to generally accepted interpreter ethics principles, including client confidentiality. Why don't we list all the ethical principles? Why are we only listing confidentiality? I understand that we mentioned accuracy here. We mentioned impartiality. But what about all the other ethical principles? right? Professional development, professionalism, all these other things, maintaining boundaries. There are a bunch of other ethical principles. And so I think for me, being a teacher of medical interpreting ethics is kind of weird to me that we only mention confidentiality outright as an ethical principle. I feel like if we're only looking at ethics, that is very narrow scope there. So that's the definition of qualified interpreter. She says 27 minutes into this thing. I'm sorry, everyone. You can always watch this later and I will try my very best to add chapters. So um, we're gonna move on from the definition section um, and we're gonna move on to policies and procedures. So the policies and procedures section, which is 92.8, uh, is all about including written language access procedures. So to be clear, this is something that in the past, it was recommended by the Department of Health and Human Services that covered entities, the healthcare facilities and other covered entities that are required to follow Section 1557 have um, encouraged them, didn't require them, but encouraged them to have a language access plan. So I feel like this is kind of like a middle ground between that. They're not saying you need to have a language access plan, but it is saying that you need to have, if you're a clinic or a hospital or any kind of covered entity, you need to have written language access procedures. So this includes things such as, if you're a clinic, how does your employee identify whether someone has limited English proficiency? How? And I like that. Because first off, there's a part of this that talks in depth about you can be, you can have limited English proficiency and still be able to carry on a conversation in English. I've interpreted for many people who are able to say, hi, how are you? My name is so-and-so. That doesn't mean that they're not, that they don't have limited English proficiency. It can be limited English proficiency in certain contexts, such as in a medical context where you have medical terminology. I've even interpreted for providers who 
not necessarily with limited English proficiency, but are native speakers of Spanish, but they have limited Spanish proficiency when it comes to medical terminology because they went to medical school in the United States. So by no means is pointing out the fact that someone has limited English proficiency a reflection of their intelligence or their level of education. It just reflects their English proficiency. That, that's it. So the fact that they're pointing out here how an employee identifies whether someone has limited English proficiency, that's important because I go to a lot of places where they're like, oh, well, they can, they can converse in English just fine, but can they go through a medical appointment without an interpreter? That's a whole different story. The language, uh, the written language access procedures have to include how an employee obtains the services of qualified interpreters and translators to communicate with people with limited English proficiency. So that's cool because a lot of places don't even think about this. And so all of a sudden they have a patient who doesn't fully, isn't fully able to express themselves in English. And then all of a sudden they're scrambling. Plan ahead, people. <laughs> Plan ahead. I understand even if you don't come to contact with a lot of folks, you know, you might not see the need for it, but here it's saying you got to have a plan. So that's nice. It's not a language access plan. It's written policies and procedures, but it tells you how an employee obtains the services of qualified interpreters and translators to communicate with people with limited English proficiency. I like that. It also requires to list the names of qualified bilingual staff members. I think that's important because there are a lot of healthcare facilities who will rely on their bilingual staff members to facilitate communication with people with limited English proficiency. But the second they have to write that stuff down, they might actually have to think about it. Mm, should we really put Maria down? Is Maria really fluent enough in English for us to be able to do this? Or is Maria fluent enough in Spanish? right? Is Peggy Hill fluent enough in Spanish to work directly with patients? Probably not. And then also too, you would hope they would get someone's permission to put their name down, right? And then sometimes even just asking someone's permission, hey, um, we have to write our written language access procedures and we're going to write your name down as one of our qualified bilingual staff members. Okay, cool. And it actually defines what a qualified bilingual staff member is. Um, so it gives you some requirements for that. So you would hope that if you're going to write someone's name down, they need to comply with those requirements. And then it also includes a list of a list and location of any translated materials they have, which I think is cool because there are a lot of times where I go to a clinic and I'm like, uh, yeah, so this uh, medical history form really needs to be in Spanish. You all see a lot of Spanish speaking patients. This is a really complex medical form. And it's going to take me two hours alone to just sit down and do a site translation of this form for this person. It's too complex. Really, the site translation guidelines by NCIHC say I shouldn't be site translating a document like this. You should go through it with the patient. But that's going to take forever. Exactly. Have a translation available. And so they finally find this translation that they have floating around. And the next time I come back to the clinic, they can't find it for the next patient. So this is going to really get them to consider these things. I'm not saying it's perfect, but at the very least, it's a bare minimum to comply with legal requirements, which is cool, I think. Oh, no. Okay. The document that I was going to open that would jump straight to the section that I was interested in did not jump straight to the section that I was interested in. Oh, no which were the documents that they are required to have translated. So those are, they used to give you a list of documents. They said including but not limited to, and it was, they, they consider them significant documents. So they gave you some examples, not a whole lot of examples, and they said you need to translate significant documents into major languages, right? But the problem with that is it was very general. Um, so let me see here. Okay, so they define these documents. So they say this is actually for the notice of availability of language uh, assistance. So this is actually a different part of, of this uh, proposed rule. Let me see here. I'm trying to find my bearings here. There it is. Oh, wait, no, it's not. I do apologize. 
This is what happens when you have 50 windows open. Let's see here, let's see here. This is where I need to put on the Jeopardy music, huh? Thank you to the person who is watching me while I'm fumbling around on my screen trying to find the thing that I was looking for. Let's do this. I'm just going to open it up again. So there are specific documents that need to be um, translated, and they give you specific examples of those. I'm not going to give specific examples of those right now because you can just go to the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking and read it. Um, all right. So we're going to go on to the notice of non-discrimination. Um, now, the notice of non-discrimination is all about letting people know about their rights. So um, many of these requirements are actually similar, but how these notices are delivered to people are a little bit different. One of the things that I really like that they mention in this is that you can even deliver these notices um, through audio which for me, I interpret for a lot of folks who are unable to read or write. So it doesn't matter if you provide written notices of these things, people aren't gonna be able to access that. It's not the most accessible thing. Um, and then of course, if you have someone who's blind or has low vision, they're not gonna be able to access that information. So, and even if someone is deaf and they can, they have eyesight, just because someone is, deaf, they might, they might have experienced, and this is something a friend uh, mentioned to me the other day, language deprivation. They might not know how to read English. They might be limited English proficient themselves. Um, another big change is the notice of availability. The full name of the notice of availability is called the Notice of Availability of Language Assistance Services and Auxiliary Aids and Services. So this used to be re referred to as the taglines requirement. So the taglines requirement says, um, you have language assistance, okay? It's available to you. Oh, and it would give you the taglines in your language, at least the top 15 languages in the state or states in which the covered entity operates. However, the requirement of the languages was removed in the 2020 final rule. So the 2022 final rule, the proposed rule that we're looking at right now says that they are reinstating that language requirement that it that it must be provided in the top 15 languages. It says that it must be provided in English and at least the 15 languages most commonly spoken by people with limited English proficiency in the state or states in which the healthcare entity operates. Cool. However, it's not just a notice of availability of language assistance services. It's also the notice of availability of language assistance services and auxiliary aids and services. So it kind of combines language access not just for folks who are limited English proficient, but also folks who are deaf, hard of hearing, who might need other auxiliary aids. So an auxiliary aid for someone who is um, blind or has low vision would be something like Braille, for instance. That would be considered an auxiliary aid, whereas an auxiliary aid for someone who is deaf or hard of hearing might be a person... Um, might be a qualified interpreter, a qualified sign language interpreter, a qualified oral transliterator, any, any number of things that are all outlined in here and defined in here. Um, so the notice has to let folks know that they have language assistance services and auxiliary aids available to them free of charge. Um, and it this outlines how often it should be provided, um, that it should be provided prominently on their website if they have one, in a prominent physical location, if they have physical locations. Um, it also mentions specific documents that this notice of availability should be provided in. That's different. Um, and it actually describes the, avail the ability to opt out of the notice of availability and other details. So this is an issue that I have with it, which is, okay, it says that if you opt out of the notice of availability, it doesn't mean that you're declining language assistance. However, I have seen how some healthcare facilities will take a non-answer or a, 
um, an answer to some other question as declining language services. So this to me seems like another way that some healthcare facilities that aren't fully aware of their legal obligations or maybe aren't even utilizing language assistance services in the provision of these notices um, or going over documents and things, they might ask them, would you like to opt out of the notice of availability? Um, it's just extra paperwork, they might say. And they say, oh yeah, sure, I'd like to opt out. You know, and of course this is occurring in what isn't the person's primary language. Okay, well, who's to say that person wouldn't accidentally click a checkbox saying, oh yeah, they're declining the notice of availability, so they're declining language access. So I don't know, it just, it, it giving the option to opt out to me seems kind of like a, a dangerous little, not loophole, but just another area where a mistake can be made to where it can be put in the system that the person doesn't want language assistance. I've seen stuff like that happen before. So um, 92.201, uh, meaningful access for limited to English proficient individuals. So this is like the meat of it. And it really gets into how and when language assistance should be provided. This is big, this is huge. Um, so the big change with this one is before I mentioned the four factor analysis where you can weigh these four factors and in the, in the process of weighing them that determines to what extent you should provide language assistance in order to comply with a meaningful access requirement. Okay. I'm not even going to express, express my own opinion here. I'm going to express the opinions of many people who left comments on the 2020 notice of proposed rulemaking, which was the four-factor analysis is super, super vague. It's super, super ambiguous. It's really difficult. It's very easy to exploit. Okay, these are all things that other people have said, not things that Kelly has said. Um, though I do agree with many of the things that have been said by other people. So, this, in the 2022 Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, they are saying we're going to do away with the four-factor analysis which me as a medical interpreter trainer and educator who has to teach the four factor analysis and I see the looks of confusion on my students' faces, I'm like, hallelujah, thank you. So this is what it says. A covered entity, so a healthcare facility, clinic, hospital, what have you, that's required to follow section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act must take reasonable steps to provide meaningful access to each limited English proficient individual eligible to be served or likely to be directly affected by its health programs and activities. This is big because instead of evaluating people with limited English proficiency as one big group, you're evaluating them each on an individual basis, which is a big reason why I think during the pandemic, we were seeing a lot of issues with, I mean, aside from the obvious issues that were occurring, like we, um, unfortunately, you saw the ripples throughout the language access community, um, interpreters and translators, if you had someone who was an indigenous language interpreter, and they passed away, or they got COVID, we all knew it, we all felt it. Um, and so there's not enough indigenous language interpreters. And so this actually makes it really difficult, I think, for healthcare facilities to comply with this requirement. And this is why I don't like these one size fits all things. I don't feel like they really benefit anyone. Um, at the same time though, if you make the law really complicated, it's become, gonna become even more difficult to comply with. So um, I think there needs to be a little bit of leeway given. Um, I don't think a healthcare facility should be held responsible for you know, if they're really doing their best, and I, I encountered some of these healthcare facilities during the pandemic. I had healthcare facilities coming to me during the pandemic saying, do you know where I can find, insert rare indigenous language here, interpreter, because we have a patient who we're trying to find interpretation for and we can't find anyone. I felt for them. I felt for them. And they were trying to do the very best that they could and they really were doing their due diligence. So I don't think facilities like that should be penalized. And I do hope, and I do expect that the Department of Health and Human Services will be a little lenient with that. Um, but at the same time, you need to document, document, document. That's the key to all of this. You gotta document this stuff. Show you made that good faith effort. Um, that way, when it comes back to bite you in the butt later because that patient wasn't provided effective interpretation, 
for their medical care and something potentially goes wrong, which that is often what happens, um, even if it doesn't get brought to court, you'll have your butt covered because you'll show we really tried, we really did. Um, so this section on meaningful access for limited English proficient individuals also talks about machine translation. Now, before in section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, um, before this notice of proposed rulemaking, even in the 2020 ruling, you still had to use qualified interpreters for significant documents. So this is a really a big change. It just makes it more explicit. A machine, machine translation is not utilizing a qualified interpreter. It's just not. It's, it's not the same. And this makes a distinction in that. So it says, if a covered entity uses machine translation when the underlying text is critical to the rights, benefits, or meaningful access of a limited English proficient individual, when accuracy is essential, or when the source documents or materials contain complex, non-literal, or technical language, the translation must be reviewed by a qualified human translator. So on the one hand, I like that they put qualified human translator. On the other hand, I'm like, why do you have to put human in there? Tell me a qualified translator that isn't a human, really. <laughs> is there one? I don't think there is. So uh, eh. <laughs> I think, though, for the purpose of this, to let healthcare facilities know and covered entities know, you got to use a human translator. Okay, just you have to for these sensitive documents. I think it's necessary to be explicit about this like this. But I also think that now wherever we have qualified translator, we also need to add the term human. I also think too, it might even be beneficial to add the term qualified human interpreter because during the pandemic, we unfortunately had issues with these good meaning folks buying these interpreting devices that do automated interpretation of voice. I even encountered, I was once interpreting for physical therapy at a local hospital and the, I was interpreting for a patient and the patient behind me, they were unable to find an interpreter. And so what were they doing? They were using Google Translate on their phone and they were using the audio feature on that. Not cool. Don't do that. Of course, they got an earful. So. <sighs> the specificity of these things is really, really important because unfortunately, if you're not specific about these things, people who don't know anything about these things, which unfortunately... You know, I have encountered my fair share of folks in healthcare who don't know anything about providing language assistance services in a meaningful, purposeful, uh, legally compliant way. Um, if you're not specific, a lot gets lost in between the lines. Um, so there's actually a long standing um, and highly relevant section that's duplicated here which is restricted use of certain persons to interpret or facilitate communication. So there are a couple of things here I wanna talk about. And I already mentioned this earlier, the use of um, unqualified accompanying adults as interpreters. So there's a restriction that you cannot, it says a uh, federal uh, covered entity cannot rely on an unqualified accompanying adult as an interpreter, except in cases of emergency, okay? However, they add some extra stuff here, which I really like. Until a qualified interpreter arrives. Or if the person with LEP, the person with limited English proficiency, specifically requests it. The accompanying adult accepts. So not only can the person request it, the other person has to accept it. And the request and acceptance are documented because I've seen a lot of times where they, they're they like, oh yeah, they said they wanted to use their daughter as an interpreter. Okay, I didn't see you mark that down anywhere in the system. You're not you're not backing yourselves up here. And you know, if, if we start cracking down on this stuff, which we really should be, we're empowering more people to crack down on y'all when you're not complying with the law as it is. You gotta have that documentation to back yourself up. And it says, quote, reliance on that adult for such assistance is appropriate under the circumstances. <sighs> There's some other stuff here that I had an issue with on this. 
Um, and that in particular is this quote that I found in the notice of proposed rulemaking. And I'm going to try to find it here. So this is the issue that I have. This is what they state. And the second limited circumstance in which an accompanying adult who is not qualified as an interpreter may also serve as an interpreter. Okay. So it's one that's specifically requested, right? When considering whether the reliance on such an adult to interpret without confirming or supplementing the interpretation is appropriate, the covered entity should consider the accompanying adult's language proficiency in both English and the primary language of the LEP individual, the possibility of bias, whether the individual is an interested party, such as in situations of domestic violence, and whether the accompanying adult helps the covered entity better understand the LEP individual. So I have a real issue with that because, so this is actually on page 47,863 of the Federal Register. So keep in mind, the Federal Register is like a big, long, continual document of all these proceedings, okay, and all of these notice of proposed rulemakings and things. So this notice of proposed rulemaking only constitutes 97 pages of this of these 47,800 and some pages, 900 some pages, okay. My question is, why are we allowing covered entities, so that is hospitals, healthcare facilities, and their employees who are not qualified at all, at all, in evaluating someone's language proficiency, to evaluate whether someone possesses language proficiency in both English and the primary language of the person with limited English proficiency? Why are we allowing that? I see this all the time. If it were left up to providers, which it shouldn't be, because providers make mistakes too, to determine when they're gonna use a qualified interpreter. I mean, I honestly think it would happen way less than it should. I've, like I said, gone to interpret for providers who are native Spanish speakers, and they just don't possess the medical terminology in their native language because they, took they went to medical school here in the United States. So, Providers can't even evaluate their own language proficiency. I have a lot of providers who try to speak their really, really bad Spanish to patients that I'm there to interpret for, and I have to constantly redirect them and try and use conflict management skills to basically convince them, like, hey, you're, you're, you're not communicating effectively with this patient. Please, I'm here to interpret. Please let me interpret, please, please. So I have an issue with that. And also, that's a lot of responsibility to put on a healthcare provider. They're already doing a million things and then you're going to make them, okay, they need to evaluate the adult's language proficiency. They need to evaluate their possibility of bias. They need to evaluate whether they're an interested party. They need to evaluate whether there's domestic violence going on. They need to evaluate whether they're actually facilitating communication and helping understanding. I will tell you, if you go on Netflix and you watch any show, if you speak a language other than English, Watch that show in that language other than English and then read the English subtitles and tell me if they match. This is what happened with Squid Games. A lot of people who spoke Korean were like, yeah, what they're saying on Squid Games isn't really what the subtitles say. You're missing a whole lot from the show, but you wouldn't know it, would you, if you didn't speak Korean? And so that's the problem with letting healthcare providers evaluate the language proficiency of people. They don't know what they don't know. By no means am I trying to say that healthcare providers are stupid. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that in this particular area, they're ignorant. They don't know. So we need to have a third party um, that is qualified to do so evaluate language proficiency. And I don't think in most cases that should be language service providers either because they have other interests at play here. And that is, that is of course, Kelly's personal opinion. So that's one issue I have with this. So then it gets on to minors. It talks about you cannot use minors, you cannot utilize a minor, rely on a minor child to interpret except in cases of emergency as a temporary measure until a qualified interpreter arrives. And it gives specific examples of this, which is great because I once went to a hospital and they said, we're not using interpreters. Why aren't you using interpreters in the freaking emergency room? Don't you know that you can't use family members as interpreters except in cases of emergency? Well, it's the emergency room, isn't it? It's an emergency. 
That is not what they mean by case of emergency. You need to have things in place. You don't just wait until things happen. It's an emergency room. There's always going to be emergencies. That doesn't mean that you're absolved from using qualified interpreters. And then it says here, they cannot rely on unqualified staff to communicate with people with limited English proficiency. So um, the next part of this section, which is 92.201, meaningful access for limited English proficient individuals, talks about video remote interpretation services and audio remote interpretation services. Give some requirements for that. So if you're a remote interpreter, this will be of a special relevance to you. Um, so both video and audio. Uh, so we're gonna, video remote interpretation, I'm just gonna refer to it as VRI. Audio remote interpretation services, I'm just gonna call it OPI. Um, requires high speed, wide bandwidth connection, no lags. Um, for video, VRI, no choppy, blurry, or grainy images, and a, quote, sharply delineated image that displays the interpreter's face and the participating person's face regardless of body position. Then for both VRI and OPI, no irregular pauses in communication, clear audible transmission of voices, uh, training for users to set up and operate remote interpreting services. Training. Yeah, y'all need some training in how to use these services because uh, it's it's a problem. So here's my issue with this because Kelly has issues with everything, of course. Uh, my big issue with this is if audio remote interpreting services requires a high speed wide bandwidth connection, what about rural areas that don't have high speed internet access? Why can't we use landline telephones? Because you're implying here that you can't use landline telephones. At least that's my interpretation of it. And that's a big problem because in the area where I grew up, I grew up in a very rural area in Virginia. I grew up in Southern Fauquier County. Yes, it's F-A-U-Q-U-I-E-R named after Lord Fauquier. I know it's a weird name. I get no cell service out there when I am visiting, which is very rare these days. Most people still have dial-up internet, and this was a huge issue during the pandemic. You were trying to do virtual school with people who only had dial-up internet access. I often get called to interpret, not even in Fox here. I get called to interpret in nearby um, Fredericksburg. Not as rural as where I grew up, but still, a lot of these places have issues with internet access. A lot of these places do not have great cell service. And so really their most reliable option is a landline phone for interpretation services remotely. So what do they do? They request in-person interpreters from super far away, from one to two hours away. That's far. So we need to keep the line open here for regular landline phone service. And this is why I have a huge issue with these language services companies switching to all digital services because it's really alienating a lot of these rural areas. So now there's actually a guidance document that the Department of Health and Human Services uh, released earlier this year called Non-Discrimination. Um, uh, it's, it's just a guidance document on non-discrimination in telehealth. And um, you can read it on the Justice Department website. So if you search for, there's actually, you can search for this on Google, Justice Department and HHS, HHS stands for Department of Health and Human Services, issue guidance on non-discrimination in telehealth, the week of the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it doesn't just talk about the ADA and um, auxiliary aids for people with disabilities. It also talks about limited English proficiency as well. And so it releases, it, it talks about some important stuff. A guidance document is a bit different from Section 1557. Section 1557 actually tells you legal requirements. Guidance documents are kind of like a how-to guide for how to comply with those legal requirements. So it's more of like just advice, right? Best practices. And of course, best practices are going to indicate the things that we do when the circumstances are ideal. So it's not an end-all, be-all document. Of course, Kelly lost her, her place again, as always. So 
Uh, the last big section I want to talk about here is the um, non-discrimination in, tel non in telehealth provision. So this is section 92.211. It's non-discrimination in the delivery of health programs and activities through telehealth services. So this section is all about equal access to telehealth. And it specifically says that telehealth needs to be accessible by all of these protected groups. You can't say, well, because you're limited English proficient, um, we don't really have the infrastructure to provide you telehealth, so we're not gonna provide you with telehealth. No, it says you gotta provide telehealth. So you have to provide telehealth, you need to let people know about telehealth in the same way, you need to let people participate in telehealth in the same way. You can't just say, well, we only provide telehealth for our English speaking patients. That's discrimination. So I saw this a lot during the pandemic. And unfortunately, a lot of times it isn't on the actual healthcare facilities for why they can't provide that infrastructure for people. It's because of these companies releasing telehealth platforms. I've seen some stuff, y'all. I've seen some stuff. If I had a nickel for every time I've, look, my eyes already twitching. If I had a nickel for every time I've seen a telehealth platform horribly translated, even just a telehealth platform I'm accessing, if they have a, if they have an ability to toggle it between languages, I'll toggle it between English and Spanish just to see how bad the translation is. And it is bad. It is horrible. If they even have it. So a lot of these telehealth platforms do not integrate interpretation services, don't have the ability to integrate interpretation services, because it's just not important to them. They want to make their money on selling their telehealth platform to these providers, but they're not actually doing what they have to do to comply with these laws and regulations. So these are things people, these are things that healthcare facilities really need to be looking into when they're signing up with a telehealth service or dedicating themselves to a telehealth platform. So that's super important. Um, and I've experienced some really interesting things as a result of this, um, this lack of, of accessibility of telehealth during the pandemic. I've been called as an in-person interpreter to a healthcare facility where they are providing, they are providing telehealth to someone and I am there to interpret for the telehealth appointment, but I'm there in person with the provider and the patients on the other end. Because a lot of times what ends up happening is they actually cannot access the telehealth platform because it's, the user interface is entirely in English. And so even to get them on that telehealth appointment where we can interpret, I got to get them on the phone and I got to walk them through it on the phone. And I literally have them saying out loud to me the words in English with Spanish pronunciation. And that's how it ends up playing out. So this really impacts people. And... I want to point out here that it is exceptionally important. Actually, if you'll give me just a second, I'm going to take a sip of water over here. Sip of water, sip of water. All right, I took my sip of water. Um, I think is incredibly important if you are providing language services that or involved in language services in some way, shape or form. If you have a family member who has limited English proficiency, it is incredibly important for you to comment on these proposed changes because you have input. You have input. And I'd like to actually, oh gosh, I need more water. I feel like I'm about to cough. Okay. doke See, this is what happens when I give a class for two hours, and then I come on here and I talk on YouTube for an hour and three minutes. Oh, my goodness gracious. So there are a couple of resources that I would like to share. There are already resources in the description of this, and I'm realizing that I was remiss in not posting some of these other resources. So in terms of what you should comment on, um, the types of comments that the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights, or OCR, will find helpful. NHELP, or the National Health Law Program, actually has a comment submission page. So you can submit comments through NHELP, and they'll provide it to the um, Department of Health and Human Services. However, um, 
you know, why you can submit it directly, especially if you want to comment on other aspects of this of these proposed changes. Let's say you want to comment on the um, their expanded definition of sex di discrimination, or you want to comment on sign language interpretation services, things like that. Um, then you probably don't want to comment through this form because they're really going to be only talking about language access in their stuff. Um, but they do give really, really useful advice. So their page um, on uh, and help, it's uh, whymycarecounts.org slash care dash in dash the dash language dash you dash speak slash. Um, and I will place that link in the comments in the description after I finish this video. Um, they give you a list. They, first off, they give you a nice little summary of the of Section fifteen fifty seven, what it means for people with language with um, limited English proficiency, and then they ask you questions based on your role. If you're an interpreter or translator, why is it important that interpreter and translator interpreters and translators be qualified? Um, that's, I think, a great piece of direction. Obviously, if you disagree with something in the notice of proposed rulemaking, please comment on it. Um, if you're an interpreter manager. Uh, what happens when individuals don't know how to request language services? Uh, and then if you support language access or support people with LEP and people with disabilities. So you can submit things about people with disabilities here um, who utilize the services of, uh, who utilize auxiliary aids, sign language interpretation, things like that. Um, what problems have you seen when LEP individuals do not have qualified interpreters? Uh, what issues have you seen when interpreters, translators, and or bilingual staff are not qualified? Uh, things like that. So we've recently had an issue here, I know in my area, where um, mental health care providers who supposedly speak Spanish are providing the services directly to um, Spanish speaking uh, patients, but they're not using interpretation services, which would be fine if they were actually proficient in that language, but they're not. So what ends up happening is those people have to repeat their stories over and over and over again. And imagine you're going to therapy. You might be talking about some traumatic stuff. And if we know anything about re-traumatization, it's the fact that if you have to tell your story over and over again, that can re-traumatize you. So that's big. That's huge. That's really important. And that is actually something I mentioned in my comment that I submitted to the Department of Health and Human Services. So this list on... Um, why my care counts uh, through and help. I'm actually, you know what? I'm just going to post it in the chat. How about that? This should appear in the comments as well. Um, it's whymycarecounts.org slash care slash. And that is a comment page where you can submit a comment through, um, I believe it's the National Health Law Program, uh, specifically geared towards language access. However, you can also submit a comment directly. You can submit a comment directly to the uh, Federal Register or to regulations.gov. I have that linked already in the description of the video. And I wanna give a shout out to uh, CCHI actually, the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters. I think, and I imagine maybe Mara had something to do with this uh, because she gave an excellent webinar with CCHI on um, the implications of these proposed rules in language access. So CCHI actually sent out an email the other day reminding everyone, hey, please, your voice matters. Please submit comments. And they gave us some ideas for what you could address in your comments, specifically geared towards people in language services. So the first thing is, do you think everyone who needs language access is getting it? If not, why not? Uh, what issues do you see when you interpret for limited English proficient patients? I could, I could write a book. <laughs> I could write a book. Uh, you want to make sure that when you submit your comments that you're not submitting protected health information because these comments will become part of public record uh, and they will be publicly viewable and potentially used in other things in the future. So that's important. And they do mention that in the comments. Um, what should hospitals, healthcare providers, insurance companies, and others do better to help LEP individuals? All fair things to mention. So you can submit your comments. They're actually due on October 3rd. That's Monday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. I'm going to briefly talk about why it's important for you to comment, because I think it's incredibly important for you to comment for a number of reasons. Reason number one, I have never felt so insignificant as an interpreter and that my voice mattered so little as I did during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
I consistently place myself in harm's way to deliver qualified interpretation. I mean, I'm a certified, I'm a dual certified interpreter, qualified interpretation services to people who really, really needed it during the pandemic. I was given little to no protection. I was not given access to the COVID-19 vaccines uh, as early as I should have been, and neither were my colleagues. Uh, and I will still, I will hold, take that to my grave. I will hold that grudge to my grave because I see that as huge, huge shortcoming um, with my state of Virginia. Um, and now that we're coming out of the pandemic, uh, I'm feeling like my voice once again isn't mattering because a lot of the language service companies that I am working with, um, especially the language service companies that I provided valuable services through um, during the pandemic who really needed me um, and really relied on me are now saying, well, if you don't lower your rates, we're not going to send you assignments. So I take that personally. Um, it's really unfortunate that it's come to this. I mean, I feel like it's been a long time coming in the language services industry. Uh, I'm sure every interpreter uh, and translator has a similar story to tell. So I, I mention all this just to point out that a lot of times as interpreters, as linguists, as translators, we're meant, we're made to feel like we don't matter, that our voices don't matter, but this is a way to make our voices matter. This is a way to make a difference. We might try, try as we might every day to make a difference and feel like we're not really making a difference. This could make a difference. So that's why commenting is important, one reason. Another reason why commenting is important is they are actually legally required to consider your comments. Your comment will be read. It will be read. And your comment doesn't need to be a, a piece of literary genius. Listen, I'm gonna be real. A lot of y'all, you're not native English speakers. You might feel self-conscious about, heck, you might be a native English speaker and feel self-conscious about your English writing abilities. And that might be your barrier in keeping you from commenting. Don't let it be. Don't let it be. You don't need to make it eloquent. It just needs to be something impactful. Impactful. Something memorable. Something that's going to stick with them when they read through those comments. They're reading through all sorts of, you read some of those comments on there. You read some comments, you're like, what? Why are you you're commenting like five words? This adds nothing of value. Whatever you have to add, you're an expert in this field. You have some experience in this stuff. What you have to say matters. So say it. Share it. And the other thing, too, is, and this is a big point of mine when it comes to uh, filing complaints with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights. They actually mention in this notice of proposed rulemaking that they actually took into account a lot of language access complaints and complaints they continue to receive, but shows me that filing complaints actually does work. They actually do read them and they do something about them. They're incorporating some of the feedback from some of those complaints into this proposed rule. And just as your complaints to the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights, your civil rights complaints matter, so too do your comments on these proposed changes. Because they mentioned a whole bunch of comments when they were talking about the 2016 rule and the 2020 rule and the reasons behind why they're made, writing the rule the way they are. So your comment matters. And you can actually make a difference here. So um, remember, it's 11.59 p.m., not tomorrow, which is Sunday, So I'm in Eastern time. Not tomorrow, but the day after, Monday, at 11.59 p.m., that's the deadline. That's it after that point. you got to submit your comments by then. And I've posted a whole bunch of resources in the comments, in the comments, I would say in the comments, in the description about how you can leave a comment. Super, super important. I said to all my friends, all I want for my birthday is for you to submit a comment, even if it's just, I support this. I support language access. Something that simple. That's it. They just need support. Because there are people out there who are posting comments saying, I don't agree with this. This shouldn't be happening. So we really need to make our voices be heard on this and really let our expertise and our experiences count.
So with that being said, I'm going to end the live stream, um, but feel free um, to leave a comment, uh, not just on the proposed, not just in the YouTube comments, leave a comment on the proposed regulations. There's a link in the, in the description. Um, let me know what you think. Let me know if I made any mistakes. I'm not perfect. I'm also not a lawyer. That is said in the comments. I am in the, in the description. I am not a lawyer. I'm not a, a legal professional. Um, I've done my very best to portray everything here as accurately as possible. But of course, I encourage you to read the proposed rule. Um, there are resources to kind of guide you through which sections in the description, which sections apply to language access. So do that. You have the weekend. You have Monday. You even have Monday after work. If you work nine to five, you got time. So use your time wisely. I've been shouting it from the rooftops for way too long. My husband's probably tired of hearing me talk about it. So once again, I'm going to end the live stream. Thank you for watching. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, for those of you who are watching later, thanks for watching.